Good evening. I'm Rami Avisar, the Dean of the Rosenstiel School. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this third lecture of our 2023 Sea Secret series. We're glad you have uh, joined us for Dr. Aaron's uh, Ari Bernstein's virtual talk, Climate Action as a Pill Prescriptions for Hertz, an especially relevant objective in Miami, where the county just appointed the world's first chief heat officer and recently launched its first ever extreme heat action plan. We would like to take a moment and thank our sponsor, the Shepard Broad Foundation, William Galway 3, Sherry Gold, KB Life Enhancement Forum, Key Biscayne Community Foundation, John Mikon Family Foundation, Gail Nansen in honor of Russell F. Nansen, Nicole N. Myron Wong, and Southern Glazer Wine and Spirits. Before we hear from Dr. Bernstein, we are continuing our tradition of spotlighting exceptional graduate students and alumni. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing you the third year Rosenstiel PhD candidate, Nikozi Muse. Nikozi is from Somerset, New Jersey. His undergrad and master's training is in meteorology and climate policy, respectively. Here at the University of Miami, his research concerns identifying and addressing heat threats in Miami-Dade County. This work also helps to inform the role on the City of Miami Climate Resilience Committee as an advocate for marginalized and vulnerable communities. Welcome, Nkozi. Thank you, Dean. I'm going to share my screen. OK, so because I don't have much time, I'm going to jump right into it. But as the Dean said, my name is Nikosi Muse. I am a third year PhD student studying environmental science and policy under the direction of Dr. Katie Mock. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about some of the work that I'm doing for my dissertation as it pertains to extreme heat in Miami-Dade County, Florida. So for starters, we know that there is a heat threat in Miami. And we're not talking about the threat from the NBA team, the Miami heat, because they're actually not even doing that hot right now as it is. But Miami-Dade County is doing pretty hot. And one of the ways that we can measure that is by looking at the average that we're seeing increase over time, as many places are across the globe. So it's one, day, one way that we can measure how heat is increasing is that we're seeing, compared to 50 years ago in the 1970s, we're seeing 50 more days, or well, more than 50 more days on average, of days that are above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, we can measure this or measure heat in many different ways. We can look at the heat index. We can look at wet bulb temperature, which actually defines how much heat the body can take. We can look at air temperature. We can look at surface temperature. There's many different ways to look at it. But Miami heat is a lot different than heat in other places. And one of the ways that we can explore that is essentially by looking at how many places actually issue heat alerts. So here's a way that you can see heat alerts versus heat attributed mortality. So on the right, you can actually see that Miami is the highest city of all the cities in this graph that has the highest heat attributed mortality, but also has the fewest heat alert days per year. Why is that? Does that mean that Miami is not hot? No, and anybody that's been to Miami can say that that is absolutely not the case. But Miami has a chronic heat threat. We on average may see more days of 80 or 90 degrees that feel like 100 degrees as compared to somewhere like Tulsa, Oklahoma, which has the highest amount of heat alert days per year, but they have a punctual event type heat where they may see a day where there's 120 degrees outside and they have to issue a heat alert. That's not the same for Miami-Dade County and it's very difficult to tackle, even for the National Weather Service. So there's different ways that we can look at heat, different ways that we can analyze it. One of the first ways is by just looking at how it feels to people outside, air temperature, surface temperature, how does it feel walking down the street? We can also look at how heat feels indoors. A few colleagues of mine, uh, Lene Turek Hankins and Myra Cruz, we partnered up to do a study that actually placed sensors in people's homes to see how they're feeling heat or experiencing heat inside their homes throughout the course of the year. And then just very similar to outside heat, but also we have to look at heat and how people experience it, especially for those who the backs of, you know, this Miami-Dade County has been built on for the past 100, 200 years that work outdoors. All of this ties into what Dr. Bernstein is probably gonna talk about a little more than I will, and that's how health is tied into all these different categories. Well, what I'm focusing on most specifically is how if people experience heat outdoors. And outdoors, many of you probably see this term before, heat islands, 
Heat islands are something that are experienced in many different urban regions across the United States, across the world. But I want to delineate that just two different important kinds of heat islands. In general, all heat islands see that there's a very, very big gradient in temperature from urban, temp urban areas or developed areas that have impervious surfaces and anthropogenic materials to places like rural and suburban regions that have more of the natural landscape still intact and in place. But there's two different kinds of urban heat islands. There is the actual urban heat island that can be measured by air temperature. Then we have the surface urban heat island. So what I mean when I say the surface urban heat island, I'm saying that at any given time, we have the sun that's emitting shortwave radiation down to the surface. And then depending on what it's coming in contact with, it's either being reflected or it's being absorbed and then re-emitted in the form of long wave radiation. Now the surface urban heat island can be seen from space as the surface emitting this heat, but we can't see that through a satellite, how experiences or how it looks like in the air, how the temperature looks like in the air, but the air may be absorbing this radiation that's coming from the surface. And at nighttime, this is also an additional threat because all that radiation that was absorbed throughout the course of the day is being re-emitted. And God forbid there are clouds there that serve as another blanket that can essentially re-emit this heat back down to the surface. So what you're looking at here is block groups for the urban corridor of Miami-Dade County. I kind of excluded unincorporated Miami-Dade here, but you're looking at land surface temperature per block group, average land surface temperature from 2013 to 2022. And you can see that there is a pretty heterogeneous landscape when it comes to the surface urban heat island across Miami-Dade County. And there are specific regions that are warmer than others, Hialeah and Alapata, hotspots, Little Haiti and Liberty City, hotspots, Little Havana, hotspot, and then we have Coral Gables and South Miami that are a bit cooler. And a lot of this can be tied to different socioeconomic variables, but also biophysical variables, whether it be the normalized, normalized difference vegetation index, which actually shows what kind of land cover type we're looking at, whether it be vegetation, barren grasslands, or water, or even impervious surface. Tree canopy, because we all know that tree canopy is actually a way to cool our environments. And then impervious surface, which is usually correlated with some type of increase in urban heat. We look at air temperature versus land surface temperature. We can see that there is an overall similar pattern, but at the same time, there's a lot more variation in land surface temperature, showing how much more sensitive the surface urban heat island is to different changes in the landscape, land cover, land type, as compared to air temperature, which may look kind of uniform across a certain area. So all in all, as I wrap up, the goals are to determine essentially what are the biophysical predictors of the Miami-Dade County surface urban heat island, as well as the urban heat island. What are the social economic predictors of the Miami-Dade County surface urban heat island and urban heat island? And then lastly, what is the relationship between the Miami-Dade County SUHI and UV? In this case, surface urban heat island and the urban heat island. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and pass it on to Dr. Bernstein. Thank you uh, very much, Nikosi, for sharing your research and experiences here at the Rosenstein School and for your public service. Uh, students is uh, student education is uh, is vital to our school mission, and uh, any of you interested to uh, support our uh, scholarship um, uh, for giving us the possibility to offer opportunities for students. Uh, is more than welcome to contact our uh, Director of Advancement, Ms. Jennifer uh, Dillon, and uh, her email uh, will be provided uh, as soon as possible. It is uh, now my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Aaron Bernstein, who is the Interim Director of the Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, is a pediatrician at Boston, at Boston Children's Hospital and the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Environmental Health and Climate Change. Dr. Bernstein focuses on the health impact of the climate crisis on children's health and advancing solutions to address its cause to improve the health and well being of children around the world. He is an author of the Human Health Chapter on the, of the Fifth National Climate Assessment, a congressionally mandated report that evaluates the impacts of climate change on humans and natural systems in the US. He regularly testifies before Congress on the child health impacts of climate change, and he is a trusted voice for major news outlets. Dr. Bernstein, leads Climate MD, a Harvard Chan Change program to encourage physicians to transform climate change from an issue, issue dominated by politics and concerns about the future of faraway places 
to one that matters to every person's hearts here and now. Ari, welcome to Sea Secrets and thanks for agreeing to be our speaker this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Avisar. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I am coming to you from a rather chilly Boston, Massachusetts, and am uh, and probably will always be envious of the warmer climes of, of Miami. Um, this evening, I would like to take a few minutes uh, to talk about climate change uh, and health, but perhaps from an angle different from what some of you may be used to. Um, I want to talk about how we can think about climate change as an opportunity to promote health, um, which is why, and I'm just going to pull up my slides here, um, I have uh, decided to call this presentation Climate Action as a Prescription for Health, and I hope you all can now see my slides. Um, I know in our audience we have a diverse group this evening. We have uh, marine biologists, um, we have molecular biologists, uh, we have community members, and I believe there are uh, a few people in the audience with medical degrees as well. Um, I'm going to use um, a medical case to provide uh, substance for my claim that we can use climate actions to promote health and importantly, health equity. I'm very grateful to Nicosi for uh, going before me. Um, I think he did an excellent job of covering some of the things I will talk about and probably better than I would have gotten there. And, and so that'll free up some time for us to go in a few different directions. But I do want to start with this uh, case of a child. And, and this child um, is not exactly uh, the, the verbatim case of a child that I have seen, but uh, boy, is it similar. And we're going to talk about what we can do to help uh, this child uh, do better. So this is a 12-year-old child who has asthma, uh, ADHD, and depression, uh, who is obese and pre-diabetic. Uh, he comes to see you, and you can now, all, uh, even those without medical degrees, they're free to put on their, their doctor hats. Uh, he comes to you for a checkup. He's taking methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, a stimulant for ADHD, sertraline, or Zoloft, which is an SSRI for depression, uh, Montelukast, singular, another medicine for asthma, and fluticasone, salmaterol, or Advair, an inhaler for asthma. Uh, he tells you that he has been getting short of breath several times a week and been having difficulty walking upstairs. Um, he also uh, avoids going outside. Uh, he says he's getting teased at school because of his weight, and he's feeling increasingly down and has had passive suicidal thoughts. Uh, what can we do to improve? this boy's health. Well, I have uh, presented this case now uh, to residents all over the United States uh, at Grand Rounds at various children's hospitals. And the crowd is typically keen to weigh in with, I think, very appropriate medical guidance. People will say, well, um, his asthma doesn't seem to be well controlled, so let's give him more asthma meds. But the reality is he's on a lot of asthma meds. And the, avail the potential of a new asthma med or more asthma meds to make his asthma better probably not going to help much. Uh, they immediately recognize that his obesity is a problem. Uh, it's a problem because he's becoming diabetic. Uh, it's a problem because he's uh, getting teased and it's affecting his mental health. And so people are also quick to say, boy, we need to get him into a, an integrated weight program so he can see a nutritionist and a therapist and uh, really focus on uh, activities to reduce uh, or, or obtain a healthier body weight. Uh, turns out that obesity clinics, um, there at most children's hospitals, are incredibly important to dealing with obesity, but it turns out that they're not particularly effective. Um, and lastly, people will rightly point out that the child's uh, mental health systems are problematic. Um, suicidality um, is always of concern. Um, this child is on multiple psychotropic medications, medicines directed at treating mental health problems, uh, and is also seeing a prescriber. So getting this child more access to mental health would probably, uh, services could be helpful. Um, but again, it's not clear that even with that, this child's mental health problems will go away. So the short of that case at the outset here, folks, is that the mainstay of medical care 
to treat some of the most prevalent conditions we see in children in this country, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail about how prevalent these things are, are largely ineffective. Um, our standard medical care when children present like this, and we'll show how commonly children have these conditions in the United States, um, our interventions from people like me on a prescription pad don't work particularly well. Uh, childhood obesity is now at epidemic levels in the United States. This is data through 2018. The pandemic has made this worse. Um, uh, the causes of overweight and obesity in the United States are made from several factors, um, access to highly caloric, highly processed foods uh, that are very inexpensive, um, increasing use of screen time, uh, uh, takes children away from outdoor activities, other activities that they may be exercising. And you can see this extraordinary trend in this graph over time uh, of more and more sedentary activity uh, and less and less physical activity. Uh, mental health among adolescents is also not doing well. These data are through 2019. Um, there are three different assessments. You can read all these graphs the same, which is over time, symptoms of anxiety, of depression uh, are going up. The pandemic, again, has not helped us here. I expect things are similar in Miami as they are in Boston. We are very much struggling to meet the mental health demands of our children. Um, one important piece of the mental health problem, I should be clear, given a talk on climate change, is climate change itself. I was personally stunned, uh, and I've been working on the, at the interface of climate and health for about 20 years, um, to see this research um, from Carol Hickman and colleagues uh, that came out last year, uh, where they asked a thousand uh, young adults in uh, uh, many countries around the world, uh, how worried were they about climate change? More than half said they were very or extremely worried. Uh, they expressed despair. Um, and critically, and what is not shown on this slide, um, somewhere around 40% of those young adults said that the worry about climate change negatively affect them on a daily basis. Um, so the climate problem, folks, for those of us who have less hair, um, is a challenge. We, we see the risks. But to younger adults, it is much more difficult. And I think we've generally underappreciated how important this issue is to them and how much more we need to do. Uh, when it comes to asthma, uh, there are about 26 million people in the United States with asthma. About 1 in 12 children have been diagnosed with asthma. Um, there are gross inequities here. Uh, among mortality. Uh, Black Americans are far more likely to die from asthma. Uh, you can see here that um, it is a real issue around costs, both in terms of societal costs of $50 billion, but also many people cannot afford the medications uh, that are needed to treat it. Uh, one of the themes I'm going to bring out in my remarks this evening is uh, not only how inequitable disease burdens are among children and among the population more broadly, but how climate actions really can improve health equity, not just health generally, but particularly among people who have suffered disproportionate amounts of disease. This is absolutely true with asthma. So um, these are data from CDC around asthma uh, rates. Uh, the overall incidence is about 8%, but you can see in black Americans, uh, people of uh, multiple uh, ethnicities are race, uh, and people of low wealth, uh, less than one times the federal power level. And the rates are much, much higher uh, than the average population. Where is asthma coming from? So we saw a great increase in asthma rates uh, through the 90s. Um, there are many causes of that. Um, the causes of asthma uh, can relate to our diet. Uh, they can relate to genetics. Um, but they also critically can relate to uh, air quality. Um, work from Susan Annenberg at George Washington uh, has found that about one in five children in the United States develop asthma because they're breathing tailpipe exhaust. And critically, tailpipe exhaust does not get distributed across communities equally. Uh, this is a map of Oakland where a really uh, impressive piece of research was done that linked block by block air quality monitoring assessments using car. Uh, there's a, monitors put in cars to measure the air quality uh, with uh, residence by residence uh, asthma uh, data from Kaiser Permanente. And what was found is that while one in five children in the United States on average 
uh, have asthma because they're breathing tailpipe exhaust, uh, which is what was seen in this study in, in East Oakland, uh, in the more affluent communities uh, in East Oakland, just four miles of distance into downtown Oakland in community of color, uh, it is uh, upwards of three in five children have asthma. Uh, and this is a trend we see nationally. So you can see here, um, who's living near a highway is not random. It is generally people of color. It is generally people of low wealth. Now, bringing that home to Miami, um, I'm guessing some of you have had to deal with this picture, which is I-95 in a traffic jam. Um, and it's as frustrating and unhealthy as these traffic jams are for the people in the cars. They're even potentially more burdensome for the communities that are subject to the pollution that comes downwind. And let's be clear, folks, who's downwind from these highways was not chosen at random. Um, Overtown in Miami is a prototypical, an absolutely classic example of what happened in cities across this country in the 1950s and 1960s. It happened in my hometown of Chicago. It happened in Boston. It happened in LA. It happened in Atlanta. Uh, you can pretty much pick a major American city and you will see a before and after photo like this, which is 1955. This is a picture of Overtown. And 1980, uh, the I-95 interchange was put in the middle of a black community. Uh, this was explicitly done on the basis of race um, and it was done by eminent domain. Uh, so we created these pollution sources in low wealth community of color. And often on top of that, and this is, I think, true in Overtown, although you all will correct me, we then decided to put um, low income housing, uh, low wealth community housing directly downwind of, of these interchanges. So to be clear, whether it's asthma, mental health issues, uh, obesity, uh, there are huge problems that are inequitably distributed in many cases that were, uh, these inequities were created by government policy. Uh, and so the question I come back to is, what can we do to improve the health of children like the one I described to you? And the answer I have for you this evening is, we really need to take climate action. Let me explain why. The biggest contributor in our country to uh, climate pollution is electricity generation. Um, we, uh, have recently in our country, uh, through Congress, uh, started investing a record amount of investments into transitioning our energy system off of fossil fuels and onto renewable sources of energy. Um, what's critical in this uh, diagram, which is from 2020, is you see on the left the sources of energy. We're still overwhelmingly using fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, to um, for energy systems. Uh, particularly for electricity. Um, and so we've got a lot of work uh, to do here, but it's important to recognize that there has never been a time uh, in history uh, where there has been more cause for optimism about this transition. About 300,000 Americans die from air pollution from burning fossil fuels every year. Now think about that for a second, folks. In the COVID pandemic, there were probably on the order roughly around $700,000, 700,000 lives lost a year. Uh, now that was an unbelievable amount of mortality for a single year. But air quality in the United States has been getting better on average, although there are important exceptions, uh, since the Clean Air Act was passed 40 years ago. And there's been tremendous progress in improving air quality, and yet we're still lo losing hundreds of thousands of lives to air pollution every year. So think about it, how much value as a society could we gain uh, by preventing these deaths? I would underscore that when we reduce that air pollution, we are going to save lives predominantly in low wealth communities uh, and communities of color because they are the communities that are most exposed to this pollution as this graph shows. There are two columns for each uh, racial or ethnic group. Um, the columns on the left are what those groups have contributed to the problem because of their consumption. So when we consume goods, we create air pollution. And the columns on the right are what they expose to. And, and what this study from the Proceedings of the National Academy from a few years ago now makes clear is while Black Americans are on average exposed to the most pollution, in fact, Hispanic Americans have the greatest disparity between the amount that they are responsible for in terms of producing pollution and what they're exposed to. So. Air pollution is not an equal opportunity killer, 
And when we reduce air pollution exposures, particularly from burning um, fossil fuels for energy production, electricity production in this country, we stand to gain for health and advanced health equity. Uh, we can improve how we build buildings. Uh, we did a study some years ago where we estimated the health and economic value of the green building movement in the United States, which is still, I would argue, in its infancy. Um, in about 15, 16 years, um, there were huge amounts of <laughs> money saved, um, but there were thousands of asthma attacks prevented, uh, many days of schools uh, kept, and hundreds of deaths. This is simply through energy efficiency in buildings, which has largely only hit very rarefied air still in the United States. And uh, this is because those buildings produce less air pollution uh, as a result. But I would argue in some ways, the health benefits of green building uh, go beyond uh, what comes through air pollution. And, and one of the most important ways uh, is through what you see here under number two, um, which is the energy, uh, the energy savings. Uh, turns out that a major cause of bad health in the United States is poverty. And in our country, we have this ridiculous problem where people are deciding between paying their electricity bill and their health care bill or their housing bill. So in low wealth communities, a disproportionate share of income is going to pay for the electricity bill, the gas bill, um, because their homes are relatively inefficient. In Miami, it'll be a bit different than many places, and we'll talk a bit about that more, and, and Nikosi alluded to this, that the challenge in Miami may be that and when it gets hot out, low wealth communities can't afford the life-saving air conditioning they may need. Um, but green building uh, really is critical at this intersection between spending on health, spending on utilities, and spending on housing. Um, these data show that about one in five households have had to give up necessities like food and medicine to pay for an energy bill. 70% uh, of low-income households are located in the urban heat island that Ninkosi mentioned, meaning that to cool those homes, they're gonna have to pay more because it's hotter out. Um, there's still a gross disparity in who can get access to things like solar energy, which is what the bottom of this slide illustrates. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge again the value of uh, the IRA in pushing out funds to make sure that we get greater penetration of things like rooftop solar. The trick will be how it gets operationalized in our states. So in Massachusetts, I'm proud to say that we have reformed our um, incentive program for um, solar so that more funds are going to be focused on the communities that will benefit most um, from solar, whereas in the past, these subsidies have tended to benefit wealthier households. Another thing we can do to help this child's mental health, uh, as well as obesity, uh, is give that child access to affordable and reliable public transit, increase the safety and convenience of active transportation and electrify motor vehicles. So transportation is, is the fastest growing share of greenhouse gas emissions in many cities. It is in fact the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And how we transport ourselves, whether it's the school or work, has a great effect on our, on our weight. Um, this is data from the United Kingdom where they were able to look at huge numbers of people, their body mass index and their means of transportation. And what you see here is a pretty good association between how much sitting in a car you're doing and how your body mass index is doing. And remember when I mentioned that our obesity clinics for children are not able to do very much to manage obesity? So when you look at this, um, people who are cycling or walking to work many days a week, um, they are going to, you know, in the UK, they're likely going to have a BMI that's one and a half points lower than, um, you know, the car only group. Um, that is far more effective than most of the evidence we have for the long term from obesity clinics, which are among the most prevalent interventions for dealing with obesity. So simply how we transport ourselves, how we design our communities can have a huge effect on body weight. Um, but of course, there are other benefits to active transportation, walking, bicycling, uh, et cetera. Um, we can save money. Uh, I bike to work not because it's the fastest way to get there, although it is 
um, not because it's really energizing for me as I go to work, although it is, um, it costs about $800 to park in our parking garage a month. Uh, and so it is a huge cost savings uh, on a monthly basis. Of course, if we're able to get enough folks off out of cars uh, onto public transit and active transit, we're gonna reduce the air pollution that's causing asthma. Um, there's also a critical part around communities. So there are a lot of folks that I know because we all bike who I wouldn't otherwise know. And we have some amount of community around that. Now, specifically in the context of Miami, we've got, we've got some work to do. Um, this is the most recent data on the bike friendly cities in our country. And I'm sorry to say cold, frigid, icy, snowy Boston um, has far outdone warm, sunny, generally easier to get around in weather-wise Miami. Um, and the good news I think coming out of Miami is that there has been an investment in a plan. This has recently uh, come forward, but uh, there's no reason if we can do it here in Boston that it cannot be done uh, in Miami. And yes, I hear you cry, you know, it's hard to find places to put in bike lanes or, or, or whatever, but I guarantee you folks, I've been in both towns, uh, if you can do it in Boston on our streets that were designed five, you know, 400 years ago for cattle paths, uh, you, you can do it in Miami. Um, we can transform the surfaces of a city. So Nikosti showed these figures before. Uh, the surface temperature, and importantly, not the same as air temperature, but a good proxy, uh, is a major factor for urban heat. It changes with vegetation, right? So it cools off. And heat is a major issue for ozone production or, or smog, which causes asthma attacks. Heat, um, we've published, is a major issue for children's health, uh, as well as women who are pregnant. Um, there's more and more evidence that heat and pregnancy affects birth outcomes. Um, it's a cause of infant death. Uh, and uh, is again bad for asthma. You remember in the case that uh, this child did not want to go outside. Well, there are lots of reasons why a child might not go outside. It's too hot uh, being one of them. Now, trees aren't just good for cooling things off. They can, absorb, uh, they can suck in carbon dioxide. So the trees in Miami are sucking out carbon dioxide every year. Um, critically in a place like Miami subject to hurricanes, uh, they can prevent flooding. So the absorptive capacity of land is a major factor in reducing uh, the amount of water that collects on impervious surfaces like pavement. Is it gonna prevent flooding during a hurricane? No. Can it mitigate that effect? Yes. And it certainly can mitigate against the heavier downpours we're seeing across the country, including in places like Miami, just from rainfall events. Uh, and then the piece, uh, one piece that is under, I think, appreciated is the potential of trees and vegetation to reduce air pollution. Uh, the very air pollution that's coming out of tailpipes and out of industrial processes. Now, it's not good for the trees either, folks. Um, let's make no mistake. Um, but it is very clear, and this goes to research going uh, back uh, almost 40 years now in Chicago, where they first were able to show how much air pollution trees are able to buffer out of urban environments. Um, Nikosi mentioned that uh, Miami uh, is uh, home to Jane Gilbert, who is one of the first, if not the first chief heat officer uh, in the country. And I think uh, the point that he raised around the mortality in Miami is critical. It is much harder to deal with heat in Miami because there aren't these spike events, as he said, like in Oklahoma. And it really requires a much more sophisticated response because you can't just give a one-off heat alert, not that those are necessarily terribly effective for all kinds of reasons we can talk about. Um, uh, you have to think about how do we change the urban landscape? How do we think about the communities that are in urban heat islands and the kinds of resources that we can deploy to keep them safe? Um, we've done a bunch of work uh, at our center in working with frontline clinics around the country to try and come up with what we call patient-centered heat plans, where we really think about the individual and their unique risks from heat. And then through clinical encounters, come up with a plan of action, which is much more accessible than simply saying, it's hot out, go to a cooling center, which may be a place a person at risk has never gone to before. It may be dangerous from the get there. We have all these instances where people who have chronic medical problems 
are out in the heat waiting for a bus and they get sick from sitting outside. And so we see a real opportunity here to be innovative and advanced uh, work. I should give a shout out here um, to the uh, Adrian Arsh Rockefeller uh, Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council. I am a fellow um, and with them and uh, the Arsh Rockefeller Center has been a major proponent of these chief heat officers. And they've also been working with Miami to deploy health-based heat ranking systems, which will, in similar to a hurricane ranking system, um, provide much more uh, clear guidance based upon the population in Miami's unique characteristics as to whether a certain uh, heat wave is riskier for people who are really vulnerable uh, versus the general average population. Because you can imagine that if you have many chronic medical problems, if you lack access to air conditioning, uh, you may be more at risk than if you're a healthy young adult. Um, to be clear, um, research has found that it isn't just older individuals or younger individuals or women who, who are pregnant who are at risk. It turns out that there's a large amount of risk even in the middle-aged adult population. Um, but nonetheless, I think Miami's focus on heat is well uh, warranted. Um, and Miami is also, of course, well known for um, thinking a lot about how to prepare for hurricanes. Uh, where it is hot in cities is not uh, by accident. I mentioned the issue around eminent domain and freeways in the Eisenhower administration beyond, where we bulldozed communities of colors around the uh, communities of color around the country and put in our national highway system. Uh, going back to the Roosevelt administration, and in 1935, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board um, made maps of 239 cities that explicitly categorized certain communities by race. Uh, as to their lending risk. And those categories are pictured on this um, slide. Uh, uh, this is work of Bikram Shandas at uh, Oregon State. And what category your community was rated going back to the 30s uh, with A being the lowest risk and D being the highest risk and communities of color. And again, it was explicitly based on, on you could not be a community of color and be given a rating above D. So uh, you can see here that the land surface temperature is lowest in the A groups and the tree canopy uh, is uh, highest in the A groups and, and the opposite for uh, D. So here we are living today in a place like Miami. Um, you can see the existing tree canopy. Uh, you can see where communities of color are. And interestingly, in Miami, I think what is interesting is that particularly in, in the northern section of the, of, of the city, there's a relatively high proportion of African-Americans and relatively um, high tree cover. Um, but note that the slide on the left is the change in tree cover, right? So this is the percent uh, change in tree cover between 2014 and 2019. Uh, and this suggests, and I'm just thinking, looking at this region here, folks, um, that there's actually been greater, um, there's been growth in vegetation in communities that have historically uh, had less. But with the Hispanic community, we don't see that. So uh, down here, uh, we don't see that same progress. So we can really start thinking, I think, about where benefits are needed most. You think about the slides I showed you folks about where the traffic pollution is, which communities are being affected, the opportunities to prevent air pollution um, causing asthma in children uh, among the many, many harms that that air pollution uh, exacts in communities. So just to give you a sense of what's possible, I'm gonna show some slides from, from Boston. Um, when I moved to Boston uh, some years ago, uh, this is what uh, the series of roads looked like to get to Logan Airport. This was called the Central Artery. I personally think it was designed to make sure that people like me who moved to Boston would never be able to get to Logan Airport. Um, but that aside, um, this was a paved paradise. Um, this was in the heart of Boston. Uh, you can see the Boston Garden where the Celtics play is right back here. Um, downtown Boston is right here. And there's just this major piece of uh, roadway, which is very hard to navigate. Um, after the big dig, which at the time was the most expensive public works progress, which buried these streets in tunnels underground, um, we got this, which is the Rose Kennedy Greenway. 
Um, now, instead of a heat island and the communities that are just on the edge of this um, are low wealth communities of color in many cases, uh, we have a cooling area. So there's lots of vegetation, there are fountains. Um, it's a gathering place. So in the summer, I can go with my kids to this uh, merry-go-round. There's all kinds of street vendors here. Um, there's a fountain, uh, you can see that right here. Um, and it becomes an urban amenity, it becomes a place to develop social cohesion. Uh, and these conversions of historic, you know, paved areas into green spaces is happening around the country now, um, not just because people don't like eyesores, uh, but because there are huge gains to be made for so many things we care about with health. Um, one area that green space, I think, has been underappreciated is in the realm of mental health. Um, so this is a study of about a million children in Denmark over a 10 year period. Now Denmark has uh, really, uh, really robust uh, health records. They have a national health system. So we're able to follow children every uh, year at their visits. We know the addresses, we know of where they live. Uh, we know the schools they go to. And what this study found was that uh, in these 10 year olds who are again followed for 10 years, uh, the likelihood of having a major mental health diagnosis was 55% lower in the children who were exposed to the highest quartile, the highest 25% of green space as compared to the lowest. And this is accounting for all of the things we know that contribute to mental health diagnosis, whether that was their socioeconomic status, the family history of mental health disease, parental age, and a host of other factors. So you can see here that when we think about green space, it's not just about cooling and the effects of cooling, it's about air quality, uh, it's about um, community building, it's about mental health, uh, and critically, it's about health equity, uh, because again, we see in most places in this country that particularly in cities, the communities that have the least access to parks and green space are the lowest wealth and often communities of color. Um, so I won't just say that climate change is key for health, it's a prescription for health, but health equity really does require climate action. Uh, I'll finish with this slide. Um, many of you who are here are here because you're engaged and interested in climate as an issue. And if you are engaged uh, on climate, you will know there is plenty of bad news out there. Um, our media are very good at picking up bad news and amplifying stories that are particularly troublesome. But I think particularly now and, and certainly moving forward, um, we need to also acknowledge that there's lots of good news. Um, our center has a monthly newsletter, we call it the Climate Optimist. Um, and I welcome you to describe for a, for a monthly dose of good news. Uh, with that, I will, I will stop and I am looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein. That was a fascinating presentation that uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, all of us here uh, really uh, will join me in thanking you uh, for this presentation. We really, really appreciate. Um, I want to thank also the audience that is here tonight. And uh, if you would like to learn more about our school, our mission, uh, please visit us on the internet at Earth dot miami dot edu. Um, we are going to have a next presentation on March 14 that uh, will be given by uh, Dr. Arya Elfenbein that is uh, going to be speaking on cultivating sushi, an introduction to the promise and challenges of cellular agriculture. Now I would like to introduce Jennifer Dillon, Executive Director of Development at the Rosenstiel School, who will host our Q&A session. session. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein. Jennifer, all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have the questions open here. We're ready if anybody wants to submit some questions for us. Um, I, did wanna, I did have one myself. I noticed that the picture that you put up of the, uh, the interstate through Boston, how long ago was that? And have they have you started to see results of the people that live nearby there having having um, better health outcomes? So it's a great question, Jennifer. So um, that project was completed um, around 2000 and 
five, I want to say. It was a very long, very long process. Um, to my knowledge, and I, I could be wrong about this, I don't know that anyone has studied the health outcomes in the communities downwind, but what I do know has happened is that there have been assessments of air quality in that neighborhood, and it has absolutely uh, and unsurprisingly gotten better. So um, I would say that it would it would be very surprising to not see a health benefit to the to the communities that that surround that that particular avenue. I know that here in Miami we have the U line, and I'm really looking forward to that opening up and and being another avenue for people to be able to uh, to utilize as they go north and south. And I know that uh, Boston has a lot of biking trails, and some people I'm sure use them once once they get open down here, one of the questions I have is, will the heat prevent people from actually utilizing it in the middle of the summertime? Because it's impressive here. Yeah, no, I, I expect it may. And I think it's important to um, be clear that there is definitely too hot for being outside and exercising for many people. And I think that that will be a, a challenge for Miami. But I think hopefully for most of the year, um, it's still going to be a viable means to get around. I, I do I do not know. I, it'd be interesting to hear from you. You know, many places here because the demand for bicycling has been so great. Because I mean, traffic is really bad here, and so many people are biking who wouldn't otherwise bike because they don't want to drive through the mess of traffic and they don't want to park, which is another unpleasant experience. So businesses, many businesses have installed not only bike cages and bike maintenance facilities on site, but there are showers and changing rooms. Uh, and, and you see more and more of that becoming a part of the norm of business operations, uh, especially in companies that want to attract young employees uh, as, as, as a desirable attribute. That's a great idea. I think that that needs to be, needs to be thought about. Um, I do have a question here. Can you comment on projected health costs of increased heat? How are there any projections for Medicare spending, for example? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Dr. Marcus. So let me let me tackle that in, in your two questions in two parts. So um, uh, in the United States, there's highly variable assessments of how much harm heat is causing. So you'll see on the low end, if you look at the CDC's website right now, I think they'd say something like 400 or maybe 800 people are dying from heat in the United States everywhere, which is absolutely un incorrect. But the CDC is going by what's labeled on a death certificate. At the higher end, you'll see work um, by, for example, uh, Drew Shindell and Chris Ebay, which have, uh, and Greg Willenius and his colleagues have written another paper on the order of, say, 15,000. Um, now, the mortality signal is a fraction, of course, of all the other problems that heat can make for uh, whether it's uh, heart disease, uh, for chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, for diabetics, big deal for diabetics, big deal for people with uh, uh, dementia, Parkinson's. I mean, heat really you can think of as um, something that will harm pretty much any chronic medical problem. And in that sense, so, so people monetize deaths, and we can talk about whether that's a good idea or not, but certainly in the realm of policy, the idea of a value of a statistical life, so if you lose a life due to an exposure, uh, there's a cost. The EPA puts at about $9 million per life in the United States, um, but the morbidity piece, uh, the piece that you act about with Medicare, has not really been well quantified, and it's because it's so hard to really get at the base of the iceberg. Um, we, we have done many, there've been many, many studies showing associations between heat and health outcomes. Um, and we those generally don't um, go to the map when it comes to, for example, how much Medicare is paying. We are embarking on a study, uh, colleagues of mine are embarking on a study, or I should say not embark, well into a study looking at the, um, extreme events that climate change has already made more likely, uh, the hurricanes, floods, fires, um, that have caused at least a billion dollars of damage. And Medicare, um, interestingly, and this is one of the problems of our health system, health insurers, uh, not just Medicare, there's other research, are saving money. And that's because when these disasters strike, they can interfere with the ability to deliver care. It's particularly true for wildfires and hurricanes. Um, heat waves, um, probably less so because they're less likely to disrupt care, although we do see many more power outages. 
Um, and what happens is that health systems are forced to defer elective care. Uh, and so really the dynamics of climate and healthcare from a financial standpoint, our insurance do, the, the, the very course outline is insurers do really well because they have less payments. Providers and healthcare systems really do poorly because they have increased costs and decreased uh, use of the elective, particularly elective stuff that makes the money. But to, to just pin the tail on your question, I don't think we have a very good estimate on the, on the Medicare costs of morbidity. I have another question here. Aren't, aren't electric vehicles a big part of the solution to tailpipe pollution? Yes, Jasper, they can be. And so um, I don't know what it's like in Florida, but we're not gonna be off these vehicles that burn gas for decades. And if um, my expectations hold, the communities that will be least likely to adapt uh, EVs uh, or have the means are going to be the low wealth communities where the pollution is greatest. Um, a lot of the pollution is sourced from uh, diesel trucks, and it remains to be seen whether our diesel truck fleet is going to be able to go the EV route or not uh, in a timely fashion. We can hope so. Um, the other thing I will say is that just going to EVs doesn't fix our air quality problem. So if we make all of our cars EVs, but we don't in fact change the electricity grid from fossils to renewables, we're gonna be pumping out more air pollution. And this is something that we and others have already studied um, that, you know, depending upon where the cars are being charged and where the electrons are being generated, you can create huge new inequities in health because the demands on the electrical grid are such that um, the dirtiest plants come on last, the so-called peaker plants. And in places like New England, that's a big deal because we're right downwind of the dirtiest plants in the country in, in the Midwest, Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so we have to think about our EV plan in tandem with the plan to decarbonize electricity. And again, that's why the IRA investments and the infrastructure investments are so critical because we do the EV thing without doing anything about where electricity comes from. We can, yes, reduce traffic related air pollutants, particularly in wealthier communities, but boy, can we make air quality bad in low wealth communities and on a regional basis. Um, so it, it, it isn't, it, you know, EVs are definitely a part of the solution. I should also add, by the way, that I don't know, I mean, I, the traffic in Miami area, I'm sure is not fabulous. It's terrible here. It's really bad in Atlanta and LA and other cities. We can't just switch from gas powered cars to EVs and, and fix the traffic problem, which has huge health tolls. So part of the obesity problem is sitting in traffic. So whether it's EVs or not, the mental health and physical health toll of having too many cars on the road is huge. Um, and, and so I think it, it is nice from an air quality standpoint, but even if that weren't present, we actually need to think more about active uh, and mass transit uh, too. We have a question about solar canopies um, not being utilized more often in various environments, especially as the panels become more cost-effective, extra shade equals uh, plus energy generation. Yeah, so, no, it's a great response. So the idea of a solar canopy is, is akin to lots of, I would say, up and coming solar technologies where you don't need these rigid panels on roofs. Uh, there are solar tiles. There, there's all of these flexible solar um, technologies. The challenge is that right now, the energy return is very small. Um, so the question becomes, is it worth it? And right now, the economics are not panning out as much as they might. So it's the, the benefit you get from shade from having a regular canopy is really good. You don't get more shade value, but you do get some energy value. And the question is, is it worth the cost differential? And right now it isn't, but it will be. Um, and, I, and I think one of the graphs I didn't show you is this remarkable trend for all of the solar technologies, whether it's uh, silica-based or others, over time, uh, the, the efficiencies have just been going up and up and up and up. And, and so I'm cautiously optimistic that we will see, I mean, there, you know, there's already prototypes for solar roads, right? So we've got all this pavement, why aren't we using it for, that's not used a lot of the day, why don't we use it for solar? Um, you know, solar canopies, um, solar charging devices. So many of you have seen like solar on backpacks so we can charge our phones. Um, these kind of things are, are still need to come down in cost and improve in efficiency. But I think that's a question of, of more of when rather than if. Um, in your opinion, how can we get clinicians not only to think of climate-related illness, heat stroke, asthma exacerbations, 
but to become actively involved in creating solutions, develop, developing interdisciplinary collaborations? So it's a great question, uh, Dr. Simano. So what I would say is our center was founded in 1996 uh, at Harvard Medical School. It's the first center anywhere in the world to focus on the health effects of climate. Looking at today where I have people who are on faculty at various schools, uh, whole groups of graduate students, which is unbelievable numbers of undergraduates, um, uh, and, and more and more providers engaged. We've got the Medical Society for uh, uh, Climate and Health. Uh, the number of people engaged across all stripes, including clinicians, it, it is growing, I would say, exponentially. Now, is it enough? No. And to your point, um, how do we get providers who, would I argue, have a uniquely important role to play in the climate conversation, not just nationally, but around the world? How do we get them more engaged? So I would say a couple of things. Uh, one is we have to meet them. We have to meet them where they're at. I mean, this is one of the hardest times ever to be a provider in this country. Uh, we've got immense amounts of burnout. We've got staffing shortages. We've got health systems on the verge of collapse, left, right, and center. Uh, and to throw something like climate at health systems, we have to be careful. Um, there's a whole process of the National Academy of Medicine, uh, of which I'm a part, that's focused on decarbonizing the health system. There's been a really good dialogue around this issue is how do we bring providers along? And that's inclusive of nurses and pharmacists and social workers and the whole composite of what it really takes to deliver good health care. And, and the message really is this. There are those who are are privileged and able to engage right now, and we're seeing more and more folks. But the lion's share of folks don't have that luxury. And so I think the strategy forward is to try and figure out how knowing about climate matters to their day jobs, which is why we've engaged on this project on frontline um, health centers around the country. We're trying to work with these providers who are at FQHCs, federally qualified health centers. Those health centers serve 30 million people in our country. That's, that's one in 10 people are served in FQHCs uh, that are paid for out of uh, HHS largely uh, uh, to try and figure out how they can work with their communities and patients to prevent harms from heat events, from hurricanes, from wildfires. And if we can do that, then we've got, I think, a, a foot in the door because we've now made climate change something actual. The number one thing, we did we did needs assessment on this for two years. Uh, we did talk to hundreds of people, did a bunch of focus groups. And the challenge is a lot of the folks, most of the folks were very concerned about what climate change meant to the communities they serve, but they didn't see how they had anything to do with it. It wasn't part of their day job. What can I do as a provider that really matters? Well, we need to think about the medicines we give because I didn't show you the data on heat and medication use. Turns out that a lot of meds we're throwing out all the time are increasing harms during heat events. Providers don't know this. And when they do know it, boy, is it enlightening as to our responsibilities providers to doing the right thing around climate. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I talked a little bit about heat plans. But once we get this idea that climate change is about clinical practice, then there's a window of opportunity to say, and you know what? We can actually reduce our own footprint, save money, address the societal issue, and critically, and many of the clinics we've talked to have done this, improve our resilience. So a really good example of that is solarization. Um, many of you will know about Puerto Rico and what happened during Hurricane Maria, where the island was you know, just destroyed. There were thousands of lives lost. The health system and the island were essentially out of commission for months. During the rebuild, um, the FQHCs were solarized. And during an island-wide blackout, in April this year, the 80 or so FQHCs that were solarized all were operational, able to deliver care, and had water because all the wells were electric. So here's an example where the clinics are have greater ability to deliver care through, you know, in that case, it was just a blackout, not from climate reasons. Um, so they have continuity of care. They're saving money because their electricity costs are, are much less. The electricity costs in Puerto Rico are very high. Um, they're able to provide water, not just to the clinic, but to the communities. And so the pathway goes from meeting people where they're at, trying to get this idea that climate change isn't just a population health issue and a health equity issue. It is. It's about a care at the bedside issue. 
And here's what we need to do about it is the stepping stone is saying, what more can we do? Now, we don't have to do them in, in sequence. We can do them in parallel. But I think the key message is we really got to think about where people are at in healthcare right now. I want to thank you, Dr. Bernstein, for inspiring us this evening. And I think that will be our last question. Uh, tonight's presentation will be available for everyone to view in the coming days on our YouTube channel and on Facebook. And again, thank you so much for your time. And this has been uh, very enlightening and I feel inspired by this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.